So today we're going to cover the membrane, the structure of the membrane, transport across the membrane, and signaling between cells, which has to do with, go figure, the membrane. Today is all about the plasma membrane. We talked about the plasma membrane previously. It separates the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. And we've covered that in depth. It surrounds the cell, but not only does it surround the cell, it surrounds all the compartments of eukaryotic cells. It's good for a bunch of stuff. Selective uptake, cell compartmentalization, protein sorting, anchoring the cytoskeleton, cell signaling, and cellular adhesion. We'll go through each. So if you haven't written them all down yet, don't worry. They're going to pop up at the top of each slide. So first up, selective uptake and export. The cell only wants to bring in certain molecules. It only wants to secrete certain molecules. It's that membrane that acts as a gatekeeper that allows only some things in and uh, allows only some things out. It's vital for compartmentalization. Here's a picture of the cell that I will never make you draw or label. It is. It's absolutely inaccurate. But the idea is there are um, membranes surrounding each of these organelles. Those membranes are made of the cell membrane or plasma membranes. Yes? What they did when they were uh, creating this, as far as why it's so inaccurate, is because they wanted to create an educational view that fifth and sixth graders could understand, which is why it's cartoony. The membrane's important for protein sorting. You can move proteins and polypeptides from one point in a cell to another using these protein sorting pathways with membranes. You'll end up moving from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus by having a vesicle pop off of the endoplasmic reticulum and fuse to the Golgi. Do you guys remember how that happens? How you get this to start pinching off? What um, parts of the cytoskeleton are involved in that? You get squeezed tighter and tighter and tighter. The membrane deforms. It squeezes. Three parts of the membrane. Uh, three parts of the cytoskeleton. What are they? <laughs> that was the last lecture. There are three parts of the cytoskeleton. Microtubules, Microtubules which act as rails. Actin filaments. Actin, right? Actin causes action. Actin causes the deformation of the membrane. Then we've got to move that vesicle from here to over there. What will it travel along? The railway, the microtubules. But it can't just travel along the railway without some sort of um, force. What carries it along that railway? Type of protein? Motor proteins. So motor proteins are going to take the vesicle, bring it over to the Golgi, where they can then fuse. That's part of the protein sorting pathway. The membrane is also involved in anchoring the cytoskeleton. Again, we just talked about the different pieces, the um, microtubules, the, cytos the, um, uh, the actin filaments. The last one's the intermediate filaments that provide rigidity, strength, structure. They're the tent poles in the tent. They're going to be anchored in the membrane. So one end is going to be stuck in the membrane, the other sticking out. It's going to be very helpful in cell signaling, uh, bringing a signal from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. So here we've got a signal molecule interacting with a protein in the membrane. That will then release a signal on the inside that can cause something to happen. Without cell signaling, your cells cannot coordinate their responses. So before we talk about how we get these different um, functions, we have to talk about the structure, because in the end, form will always determine function. So let's go over how the membrane gets its form, what it's made of, and how the chemical reaction interactions can lead to a function. So we'll begin at the beginning. A biological membrane is often called a mosaic. You guys ever made mosaics in like an art class? What is a mosaic, generally? Yeah, you get a bunch of little pieces, a bunch of colors, and put them together to make a picture. So here we got a whole bunch of little pieces, tiles, white ones, blue ones, um, 
yellow ones, green ones, individually, they have absolutely no merit. They have no uh, properties associated with them, aside from their color. It's only when you put them together in a certain way that you get what's called an emergent property, something new arising. Biological membranes are very similar. Individual pieces don't do much. But when you put them all together, suddenly new properties arise. Pardon? So it's, it's the same with atoms, yeah. There are three tiles that make up this biological mosaic. And you've heard of them all, I hope. Lipids, proteins, carbohydrates. These are three of our classifications of macromolecules. One of our big classifications is missing. What classification is missing? Starts with a carbohydrate. Waxes are lipids. Nucleic acids are missing. We're missing the nucleic acids. No DNA, no RNA on this outside. But there are lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates. By far, the most abundant molecule in the phospholipid bilayer, or in the plasma membrane, is the phospholipid, which is why it's alternatively called a phospholipid bilayer. Here you can see the phospholipids uh, as these sort of ping pong balls with tails, and then embedded within them are different proteins. Now, what do you know about the solution that's up here? It's water, it's, so it's an aqueous solution. And down here, it's, it's also an aqueous, yeah, it's also water. So we have seen these phospholipids before. They are amphipathic. What does it mean to be amphipathic? Just the opposite, but you, you're dead on. It's got a polar section and a nonpolar section. These phospholipids in particular have a polar head and a nonpolar tail. That polar head then is going to orient toward water and the polar tails away from it. So one part of it's polar, one is not as amphipathic. For the phospholipid, you definitely have a polar head and then two nonpolar tails. And just take a look at the structure of it. You've got, again, polar head and then a long straight tail and then a tail with a kink to it. Now, just like with unsaturated fats, why does it have a kink? That's right, it has a double bond there. And that bends the tail. That's going to come into play in a few minutes. But that's not the only molecule that's in the phospholipid bilayer. There's all sorts of other things. There's also proteins. Now, proteins, remember, are made up of amino acids. Here, we have different proteins embedded in that bilayer. And you'll notice these little squiggly things, these, these, um, these uh, helixes. Where have we seen those before? Protein structure. They're secondary structures. What's that secondary structure called? An alpha, yes, an alpha helix. An A helix, yeah, that's fine. Uh, these alpha helices, are, they do have that coil shape to them. And that shape's going to come into play because form determines function. You know that the things that are facing this section right here have what chemical properties? The amino acids that are right in the middle of that phospholipid bilayer are, have what chemical property associated with them? Let me put it a different way. So here's, this is a lipid phospholipid bilayer, right? These are in this bilayer. So what do we have to know about the chemical properties of it? OK, it definitely has to do with water. What does it have to do with water? It doesn't like it, so it's hydrophobic. And thus, up here, where it's exposed to the water, hydrophilic, and down here, hydrophilic. So you have a hydrophobic region that anchors it in that bilayer. Um, these alpha helices serve other points, too. You guys have seen, I assume you've seen a, um, a slinky before, right? OK. No? Well, sorry. Uh, if you've seen a slinky or a spring, it uh, coils around. But you can look through the center of it. You can drop something through the center of it. These end up then becoming pathways through the membrane. Anchors the proteins. Yeah, so they can't move once they're in there. They can't move out of the um, phospholipid bilayer. So it's like a coil that goes around the 
and it still becomes a pathway because it's like, like a slinky, like a, slinky, um, like a train, a tunnel going through a mountain. You can't move the tunnel in or out of the mountain. Ooh, tricky. So you've got these proteins embedded in the bilayer, and you'll also have carbohydrates attaching to them through a process called glycosylation. We've heard of glycosylation before. Where did we hear about glycosylation? That 10 minutes ago when we went over it. So glycosylation happens in what organelle? <laughs> the endoplasmic reticulum. Glycosylation is the attachment of a carbohydrate. So if we add a carbohydrate, we glycosylate a, a protein, it's no longer just considered a protein, now it is a glycoprotein. Because why not? We add a carbohydrate, we'll add glyco to the prefix. If we add a carbohydrate to a lipid, it's called a glycolipid. That's just terminology. Again, we don't have a very clear understanding of why glycosylation occurs. We do have some really good hypotheses I'll talk to you about, but it hasn't been solidified. These membranes are in a constant state of flux. They're constantly shifting around. It's almost like a crowded room. In a crowded room, people are always moving, aren't they? Even if it's not very much, they're shifting around each other. Maybe they're trying to get more relaxed. Whenever there's one of those, uh, like a lockdown drill or something, it's not like you just stay st stuck in one spot. People are leaning against a wall. They move. They go to uh, sit near somebody else. There's not. There's constant movement. You've witnessed in a stadium of people, thousands of people sitting down. There are emergent properties that happen as people shift and as they move a little bit. You see a wave. Occur, you know. You've seen people do waves in a stadium, right? That's just a little bit of movement, but there's constant movement. Go to a movie theater. There's still constant movement, even though we're supposed to be sitting in our seats. I know, I just went to the movies this weekend, and people got up like 15 times in front of me. What movie? <laughs> uh, the, um, what was it called? It was the, Jack Black. yes, it, was, it had Jack Black in it. It was the house with clocks in the walls or something. Was it good? It, it, for a, I went with a bunch of kids. It was, it was a super fun few hours for me. Is Jack Black amazing? Jack Black is usually amazing. So, <laughs> right. Actually, in this one, he was he was very good for the part. But you know what? We're gonna stay on topic. <laughs> so, <laughs> these things are constantly <laughs> sorry. <laughs> these things are constantly moving around. Um, think of it as. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna need a second. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> now, <laughs> integral membrane proteins um, are going to be embedded within the membrane. They're stuck in there. They can't move. Why? What's going on right here chemically? Hydrophobic. Yes, hydrophobic thingies. Well, well said. There's yes, th it's hydrophobic. Yes, we have a hydrophobic effect going on. They are stuck in the membrane. They can't move up. If this was to move upwards, what would happen? It would be in the hydrophobic region, be in the hydrophilic region. There's water up here. It hates water. It's going to come back down here. It doesn't want to move. Um, it is stuck. Same here. This is called an integral membrane protein. It is a lipid anchored protein. It's anchored in the bilayer. It's not moving. Do you see? So what we have is a hydrophilic region up here, a hydrophobic, a hydrophilic. Same structure, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic. When you've got those hydrophobic bonds, you um, anchor them solidly into the membrane. They're not leaving the membrane. They can float along the membrane, just like if you were to throw a log into the ocean, part of the log's underwater, but it's sort of still floating. It's moving along. Attached to these integral membrane-bound proteins are termed peripheral proteins. Peripheral proteins are on the outside. Think of your peripheral vision. It's to the sides. 
So you've got um, something going on associated with the membrane, but not directly connected to it. This is connected to a protein that is connected. So this is in the periphery. Does that make sense? So peripheral membrane proteins, integral membrane proteins. The peripheral ones may be important for a, um, a cell signaling, because a signal can come in on one side of the membrane, interact with that protein, and cause this one to release on the outside. Yeah. So integral ones are integrated in. They have something uh, con they're connecting with that hydrophobic region. Here, here, here. Peripheral ones are not attach touching that hydrophobic region. See the difference? OK. So integral membrane proteins are embedded in the plasma membrane. They're touching the hydrophobic region. OK. Uh, peripheral proteins, they do not touch the hydrophobic region, but they're still close to the membrane. So this, um, this plasma membrane is what we would term a semi-fluid. And the reason for that is it only moves in two directions. On the plasma membrane, you can move forward and backwards. You can move left and right. It's hard to move up and down. In regular fluids, you can move forward, backwards, left, right, up and down. When you're swimming, you can dive down, you can go up, you can swim left, right, forward, and backwards. You can't do that here. But there is still constant shifting around. Can I borrow this? Thank you. And yes. So what's happening is you might have your squeaky container again. You might have these shifting around. That's possible. Or if these two are linked together, they have a process that both of them are needed for. For instance, pulling in different types of, um, of, of solutes from the environment to create a new macromolecule inside of the cell, they might need to be linked so they don't move apart. These guys are constantly moving, but they can become linked. The way they can become linked is if they are glycoproteins. What is a glycoprotein again? Protein with a carbohydrate attached. So what can happen is the two carbohydrates can reach out and bind to each other. If you've seen Gilligan's Island, and I don't expect many of you have, but if you have seen it, OK, good, thanks. It's a bunch of castaways stranded on an island. They have rope. I'm sorry, they don't have rope. They have vines and they have uh, bamboo. If you take bamboo and throw it in water and you try and step on it, what happens? It either goes down or it like, splits apart and it goes sideways. In order to create a raft, you need to bind them together in some way. In this case, they binded them together with vines and then they made a raft they could leave the island on. Never worked. But same thing happening here. These would be the bamboo. The carbohydrates attaching would be the vines that link them together. So this is one possible thing, uh, reason we have glycosylation. Yes? So it's a raft. Yes. Where it all splits apart? There could be, but most cells are evolved in such a way that that doesn't happen. All right, so we have these rafts floating along. The cellular environment, though, is not static. It's changing. The waves, the sea could get rough and turbulent, or it can be calm. You can have a lot of motion or a little bit of motion. So there are a few things that uh, affect fluidity. And it's all about the phospholipids. First off, length matters. The length of the tails of the phospholipids plays an, uh, an abnormally large role in how fluid the membrane is. The reason for that it lets is um, it's all about distance. Uh, Haley, can I use you for a second? I just here, stand up. Hold out your arms. OK, so grab my hands. We have a lot of motion, right? I can move left and right all over the place. If, sorry, we have less, there's a lot less motion. Does that make sense? It goes, thank you. It's swing dancing versus eighth grade dance. 
You know, it's like, uh, I assume, I don't know what your eighth grades are like. But uh, for the most part, they do this whole weird zombie thing. Um, so the longer the tails, the longer those connections, the more um, fluidity there is, the more motion there is. The kinkier a foster lipid is, the more fluid you have. Where that kink is, that bend, that's where you're going to have um, the more fluid. So depending on where that kink is right there, where that double bond is in the tail, you can increase or decrease fluidity. If the kink is at the very bottom, these phospholipids can get right next to each other. They squeeze in tight, and there's not much motion. If the kink is farther up, the tail juts out at a more awkward angle. And when that happens, the two phospholipids are farther apart. So there's more motion they can have. If you've gone to a concert, at the very, very front of the stage, there are people packed in really tightly. And if you haven't, you're just not cool like me. Don't, don't give me wrong. The last concert I went to was like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles concert. So, yeah, 1987. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. I forgot you guys weren't born then. Um, coming out of our shells. I still have the thing. Vanilla Ice sang at it. What? Was I in the mosh pit? I totally wanted to be. Um, you go down. Actually, I take it back. I went to a They Might Be Giants concert. Um, again, dating myself, though. Um, so when you're in a concert, you can be up front, and it's really tightly packed. People are near the stage, and they're not moving much. You got that weird swaying thing they're doing? You hit a mosh pit, though. What happens? They're, they're a bit tighter together, aren't they? They're tight together until they start punching. It's never be stepped on. So the more motion you have, the longer your kinks. Think about it in a mosh pit. If people are swinging their arms around, you're not going to be too close to them. Or you take them down. I'd love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> that turtle concert was, um, was rough. That's why you have a shell. Um, the cholesterol. Uh, in the membrane will keep the membrane stable. You guys have heard of cholesterol, right? Cholesterol is bad, except it turns out we kind of need some. Granted, we don't need nearly as much as we take in. What cholesterol does at high temperatures is it holds the membrane together so it doesn't fly apart. At low temperatures, though, cholesterol acts as a lubricant. It allows these phospholipids to slide past each other. So between these three things, length, kinkiness, and cholesterol, you can determine the fluidity of the, me fluidity of the membrane. So cholesterol, cholesterol holds them together, makes them more stable. It holds them together at high temperature, <coughs> or it lubricates them at low temperature so they can slide. I realized as I was going through it with the last class, um, most of these big concepts all have three parts to them. And coincidentally, most of my exams have three-point questions. I just want to remind you, in case something like this pops up on the exam. I have no idea. Probably not, because I'm lazy and I wouldn't want to grade it. That's the right answer. Thanks. So. Um, We've got this, these, the movement of the uh, membrane now. We've got rafts floating along it, held together. Some of these protein rafts are floating. They're sort of, yes, that's a house in the ocean. Uh, some of these houses are floating. They're moving with the current. Houses, some of these proteins are floating, moving with the current. This house got washed out to sea. And I don't think it was, I think it was Hugo, actually. You never heard of Hugo. You never heard of Hugo. <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> yes, a semi-fluid is you can move left, forward, backwards, left, and right. You can't move up and down. Yeah. Um, so th like this house, it's not tethered to anything. It can just float along until it eventually sinks. But it could just keep floating. Some proteins are stuck in one place. Buoys don't move much. 
So here's my question to you is, what would this be stuck to that stops it from moving relative to the inside of the cell? OK, if this is, sorry, this is a protein. <laughs> sorry. This is a protein in, on the, in the phospholipid bilayer. Sometimes they just float around. They're not anchored to anything. But if they end up stuck in one place, they don't move relative to the inside of the cell. What are they anchored to? Think, OK, boats, right? If you have, I'm going to steal your stuff again. You got two boats. If you link them to it, you tie them up to each other, and they're out in the ocean, they still float along. But they float along together. Does that make sense? That would be what glycosylation is good for. But how do you get them so they stop floating along? You anchor them. What do you anchor them to in the, well, in, in the, in the ocean? You anchor them to the bottom, right? It catches something. Uh, you've got a, a, a very, very heavy chain or a very, very heavy object down there. It's stuck on something. But you can't do that in the cell. So what does it anchor to in the cell? No, it doesn't have to do with the word hydrophobic, sorry. Back to hydrophobic. Yeah. Well, that's my question. What? OK, here's your hints. Um, think about your body, right? You move things around. What keeps your skin in one place? You know what? That's the best answer I've ever heard, my belly button. <laughs> That's OK, so Bio 102 is next semester. You're not going to make it. <laughs> You're not going to make it. Um, all right. That's exactly what it's anchored to. <laughs> Thanks for recovering this, Haley. No, no, we're going to ignore the belly button comment. We're moving on with Haley's correct answer. So the answer is the cytoskeleton. The actual thing, yes. Actually, this protein has to be anchored to the cytoskeleton. Specifically, ooh, trickier. Well, actually, we've got to go to hint. It's one of three answers. Up, oh, back to threes. What part of the cytoskeleton does it bind to? That's exactly right. Intermediate filaments. Why? Because they give it structure. It's the intermediate filaments are a part of the cytoskeleton that this would bind to, are the specific component. The intermediate filament provides rigidity and strength. So the protein will bind to the cytoskeleton. How would it bind? Because it has what kind of region associated with it that allows it to go through the, the um, phospholipid bilayer? Hydrophobic region. Yeah, we're getting to that. No, both you and Amber are like, oh, no, it's got to have something to do with that hydrophobic region. OK. okay. Pardon? So the protein can anchor, yes. Well, and for a number of other reasons, but that's one reason. Yes? Uh, how do you know which way um, Typically, you just observe it. So some of them are floating and some are anchored, and you just notice that. Correct. If it's anchored, it's to the cytoskeleton. All right, so now we've gotten to the point where we've got the structure down. If you can understand the structure uh, and the form, the function follows from that. It's made up of phospholipids, proteins, and carbohydrates all working together. The phospholipids, these amphipathic molecules, build a bilayer. There are proteins embedded within that cause things to happen in the cell and outside of the cell. And those can be held together using those carbohydrate strings, those glycosylated proteins and, and um, lipids can connect to each other and form these um, raft communities. These content review questions are here really to focus your studies. Uh, they are what I took away as sort of the most important moments of the lecture, not to say that any part of it's not important because it's biology, so it's all important. Um, in the next lecture, we're going to be going over a very, very sh brief lecture on how the membrane is formed, specifically how phospholipids are built and how they're inserted into the membrane at the endoplasmic reticulum. So uh, I hope you stick around and enjoy it.